students can go and, and then work on those uh, computers. Okay. They okay. have to go there, stay there, and mm -hmm. then work on their problem that is permitted, but remote access is not yet permitted mm -hmm. to Amra University. Okay, okay sir, uh, it's time for us to start. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let me. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning, students and other audience uh, outside uh, Andhra University. Uh, let me extend your warm welcome to the prestigious lecture by Dr. V. Ramaswamy, Director, Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory at Princeton. Uh, uh, the other audience can join the YouTube link now. And then before that, uh, let me have the pleasure of introducing the speaker, Dr. Uh, V. Venkatachalam Ramaswamy uh, is the fourth director of the NOAA's uh, Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory and he became its director in 2009. Uh, Ram was named the acting director of the laboratory in 2007. Previously, he served as leader of the Atmospheric Physics and Chemistry Group and senior scientist after joining the GFDL research staff in 1987. Under his leadership, a new era and supercomputing was launched at the GFDL. Significantly, uh, it enhanced the computer power and has enabled higher resolution and greater complexity in the lab's climate models. Uh, the GFDL now routinely runs experiments using very high resolution global climate models capable of revealing regional details. The lab's new Earth system models simulate the interaction of biogeochemical cycles, including human influences with the climate system. Future projections from these models produce a level of detail and realism not previously possible. Since 1992, Dr. Ramaswamy has been a lead author or coordinating lead author for each of the assessment reports for the Intergovernment Panel for Climate Change, for which, along with uh, uh, the former Vice President of the U.S., Al Gore, they have been awarded the IPCC's uh, Nobel Prize. He has continued to have a leading role in the Global Change Research Program and served on the Joint Scientific Committee, including as Vice Chair of the World Climate Research Program. Dr. Ramaswamy is Fellow of the American Geophysical Union and also the Fellow of the American Meteorological Society, and he has received the World Meteorological Organization Norbert Gerber Award three times. Dr. Ramaswamy has also received numerous other awards, including the Department of Commerce Gold Medal twice and the Presidential Rank Award. Dr. V. Ramaswamy's research career has focused on improving our understanding of the atmospheric physics and the roles of natural and human influenced factors driving climate change by developing and using the state-of-the-art climate models. The published research includes over 150 papers in standard refereed journals. Dr. Ramaswamy teaches atmospheric radiation with applications to climate in the atmospheric and oceanic science program at Princeton University, and he has mentored many graduate students, postdoctoral and visiting scientists. Dr. Ramaswamy received his PhD in the atmosphere science from the State University of New York at Albany and a bachelor's and master's degree from the University of Delhi. Uh, with these few words, I now welcome Dr. Ramaswamy to deliver his lecture. Dr. Ram. Uh, Professor Ramakrishna, thank you so much uh, for this opportunity. Um, I hope my voice is coming through as well as yes, you sir. can see my slide. Okay, thank you. So yeah. thank you so much for this opportunity and, um, you know, this uh, nice, very nice, uh, gener generous words that you have, that you have uh, just said about me. Uh, I'm really thankful for that and I um, uh, look forward to, uh, to presenting this uh, lecture as well as, uh, you know, hearing questions uh, from all the audience. So uh, although it's virtual, I will try to sort of make it uh, uh, you know, as if uh, we were there in person. Uh, and I hope you can uh, follow my slides. If you if you cannot, then just let me know and uh, I can try to do something. So first of all, greetings from uh, GFTL in Princeton. Uh, very happy to be here. And what I uh, chose to talk about is uh, modeling and understanding of the global climate system uh, with some examples from uh, various uh, categories, but in general talking about from past to future. So when we talk about the Earth system, uh, what we are looking at is a system like this, where, of course, in a, in a schematic sense, you have the atmosphere, you have 
uh, land and uh, you have topography, including mountains, you have oceans, and then you have things happening in the oceans like ocean circulation, biogeochemistry, uh, upwelling uh, and exchange of carbon. And then you have the land surface, uh, including coastal regions. And then, of course, you have all the uh, pollu all the uh, em emissions occurring, uh, both in the form of gases and particulates. And then you have the cryosphere also shown in sort of in a small section here, uh, the ice sheets. And uh, what, of course, we are trying to understand in terms of the Earth system uh, is the changes and the variability that occur there. That's kind of what the um, what the principal um, uh, quest is in terms of modeling it. In, and, in, and when I say modeling, I mean the mathematical modeling using equations. So some of the things that we have actually been able to do uh, in the recent uh, decade, over the recent decade, and particularly the last five, six years, is actually simulations involving all these things that are depicted here. Uh, clouds in the atmosphere using very high resolution models. Uh, I'm going to show some other results from that. Uh, transport of uh, aerosols uh, across great distances, and this is actually a dust storm that arose uh, in June, and it started in the western part of the U.S. and then traveled all the way across, and it could be tracked by satellites, so the models could also simulate that. And then uh, atmosphere-ocean interactions uh, involving, for example, El Nino, La Ninas, uh, and doing it at high resolution, both the atmosphere and the ocean, in order to capture the effect of eddies. Then you have the land atmosphere interactions, the effect of uh, both albedo and roughness on the circulation, and in turn, the effect of circulation on the land. Then coastal systems, it's actually the Chesapeake Bay, uh, where we are performing model studies for salinity, oxygen, and temperature in, the, in these bay areas, which are very um, highly rich in nutrients, and therefore there are a lot of critters and marine ecosystems that are very, very alive there. And then eddies in the ocean, I already sort of mentioned this, trying to capture them with very high resolution ocean models, sorry. And then marine ecosystems uh, in the ocean, really what's happening in terms of the living uh, marine species that are there. So let me first maybe dwell on the modeling essentials. What, what, do, we cons what do we kind of take as a fundamental thing in terms yeah. of mathematical Ramson. modeling? Yeah, yes, Ramson, yes, uh, yes. Can we upload the slides? Uh, I'm sorry? Only have you uploaded the slide, first slide? Because I'm I'm only seeing a combination of slides. Uh, can you see the? I, I didn't upload the slide. I mean, I have the slides. Yeah. But uh, but can you see the slide, or you're not seeing the slide? I'm not seeing the slide. I'm I'm seeing uh, uh, the complete uh, mosaic of the slides. No, no, right now. Do you see it now? Oh, uh, not yet, not yet. Can Can you go to that box, uh, the square with an arrow there? And then yeah, it's it it is it says tell me it's sharing. Yeah. Um, but now it now it should stop sharing. So. Yeah. Are you Can saying you... that? Okay. Yeah. Let me... uh, yeah. Only all the mosaic I'm I'm able to see. I'm not seeing the individual slides. Ah. Maybe. Okay. Okay. But I I am in the slide mode. Oh, okay. Okay. I, I, I'm in the slide mode. Just click, mode. Just click on that. Click on that. Um, okay, you're not seeing. Um, so, so now you should see the mosaic of all the slides. Yes, yes. But yeah. then I'm going to slide show now. Yes, yes. Is, is that not showing? Is that, are you seeing the individual slide? No, not yet. Not. Ah. Just, just, uh, uh, just to click on the cup there. The fourth one. The sorry, what one? I the uh, fourth one. Uh, I can't. I mean, uh, yeah. So where exactly your cursor is? Where exactly your cursor? Yeah. And then uh, screen show presenter view. No, 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 no. Huh? Yeah, just say enable editing. Enable editing at the top. Enable go to the top. editing. Go to the top. Go to the top. Above the mosaic, you will see enable editing. Okay, let me. So in the slide, you mean? Yeah, because uh, above the mosaic of slides, uh, uh, you have some enable 
Yeah, yeah. Okay, let me let me see. Okay. Um, now I've lost that mode. Let me let me sort of go back to. Okay, so you're saying enable editing here? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah, let's see. Yeah, you, you, I, yes. Yeah, now. Now, okay, let me go back. I push it. Now you share. Now you share. So I'm trying to share now. Yeah. Uh, okay, let me try this one. How about now? Uh, not yet. Not, not yet. yet. Share tray. You say open share tray. Yeah, so I'm in the slide Ooh. mode, so that's why I'm a little surprised. Uh, yeah. Share tray. Okay. Yeah. Open your PPT first. Right, I open it right. Yeah. And then, I'm, and uh, then. Yeah, uh, keeping it as it is, you come to the open share tray and then click on that. So I'm not seeing the open share tray. Uh, this is the fourth one after the mic. After the mic, you will see a small picture. See, uh, I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm not seeing those things. I'm not seeing. Uh, really? Uh, okay, let me see. So, this is the share tray. So it says, so it says, I'm already open. Yeah. So now I'm opening share tray. Yeah. And uh, let's see. So, can you see anything now? Can you see? Yes. Yes, I, I could see some slides. In you can see some slides. Okay, let me. Yeah, then, then you go to the cup, and then ah yes, now you got it. Yeah. Is that right? You can yes. see the slides. Yes. Ah. Yes. Okay. Good. Ah. I don't know why how how it happened, but I hope this stays like that. Uh, so, I guess you didn't see any of the slides. So let me go back to the beginning. Uh, yes. Yeah. This is the first okay. slide. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So you can see this slide, which is the yes. showing a schematic of the yes. system. Yes. Couple yes. system. Okay. Thank you. So sorry about that. Um, I apologize. Yeah, so okay. this, yeah. so this is the Earth system we are trying to model, where we have the atmosphere, uh, of course, uh, with the powered by the sun, and then you have a land consisting of mountains, uh, consisting of vegetated land, and then you have uh, coastal systems, and then you have the oceans with the uh, sea ice, with biogeochemistry going on, active biogeochemistry with, with the uh, living marine species. And then you have uh, ice sheets also. And then you have uh, the emissions of gases and uh, par particulates. And this is, this, is what the, this is a system that we're trying to model and trying to represent mathematically. And it's a coupled system. So you have the atmosphere, ocean, biosphere, cryosphere interacting with each other. And the important thing to remember is they all have different time scales. And that's why it becomes a very rich nonlinear system. And these are some of the examples. And by the way, if you can't see the slides, just please shout out because uh, I don't want to go on show, you know, pretending that I'm showing the slides and there are no slides visible to you. So this is a, what we are doing is an integrative modeling strategy, which means that we are taking the system as a coupled system and thereby capturing the weather, water, climate, and ecology. And these are actually some of the examples on simulations that we've done in the recent, uh, over the last five, six years with our models. Uh, whether it be high resolution models simulating clouds, the transport of uh, aerosols and gases across continental scales. Uh, this is actually a, a dust storm started from Southwest US and tra traveled across the entire US. And then the atmosphere ocean coupling involving the study of El Nino and La Nina, particularly the role of uh, eddies in the ocean exchanging fluxes of the atmosphere. Land atmosphere interactions consisting of uh, interactions of albedo, roughness, um, and then you have the uh, the uh, coastlines with the ecosystem. This happens to be the Chesapeake Bay, where we are st uh, studying the effect of changes in oxygen, salinity, and temperature all the way from the top of uh, from the surface to the bottom, uh, because it's a uh, it's an area which thrives with uh, 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 living marine species. And then ocean eddies, uh, which carry the heat and uh, salt. Uh, from one region to another, which is very important for ocean circulation, and then the marine ecosystems uh, which live uh, at different places uh, in the ocean. And then I will go to what are the essentials of modeling uh, that we have to keep in mind in a very kind of a fundamental way. So 
well, the fun, the fundamental thing is, of course, conservation equations. So you have conservation of the uh, water vapor, the water substance. You have conservation of momentum, he, uh, heat, uh, and then so you have the continuity equation of motion. You have processes of advection, precipitation, evaporation, the balance in the Earth's surface, radiation transfer, which kind of governs the incoming uh, net incoming uh, solar radiation and the outgoing infrared radiation. And of course, the thermodynamic equation, which forms the basis for the interaction with the with the dynamics. So that's kind of a little bit more on the atmosphere side. And then on the ocean side, you have, of course, uh, again, the exchange of momentum, heat and water across the interface between the atmosphere and the ocean. Uh, you have the precipitation in the ocean, uh, which freshens uh, the, sorry, which is the precipitation over the continents or the oceans, it freshens the water in the ocean. Uh, precipitation can fall as snow. There is advection of uh, substances. And then, of course, there's radiation interactions. And then in the ocean itself, you have a mixed layer, and then you have deeper layers in the ocean. So this is a schematic representing what all things you have in coupling the atmosphere and ocean. And this kind of forms a basis. Uh, I'm not just kind of mentioning land and sea ice. Or that's also part of the mathematical system. But this is, in a nutshell, the uh, considerations that you take to build a model. And of course, you know, with the uh, equations being highly nonlinear uh, and, uh, you know, highly uh, in interactive in the sense of thermodynamics, the dynamics, and then the conservation laws all had to be obeyed. And so you have to resort to supercomputers uh, or high performance computers to do these calculations. And then, of course, the test is of the calculations is are you. Uh, able to simulate what is being observed because that is a test of uh, of this integrative modeling strategy. Some of the things that uh, I kind of want to mention, and this will be very sort of general because I, if I, I can't go into detail, too much details, otherwise it will take us too much time. But I just want to reflect some of the considerations that we have in modeling. Uh, so one of the things, of course, in modeling is capturing the resolution because increasingly uh, the information required of the climate system is on you know smaller and smaller scales because that's where human beings live. So resolution is an important criterion. Uh, you also have the complexity of the system and this involves a lot of things. I mean, whether it's the atmosphere or ocean or ice or biosphere, you always have complexity. So you have to kind of, and, and you can see these twin arrows and this is kind of what we've been doing over the last decade, marching in the direction of these arrows, increasing complexity, increasing resolution. But you know, there's a limit. You can't indefinitely keep on doing this, even with the highest computational resource possible, because you have to be able to understand at every stage what the system is doing, even if you have to compromise on resolution or complexity. And then resolution and complexity are not the only things. You have the simulation time that you have to consider, whether you're talking about weather time scales or climate time scales. And then weather and climate are really seamless because the weather of today starts to determine the climate of tomorrow. The climate of yesterday starts to determine the weather of today. So you have to consider the simulation time, but that's not enough either because then you have to try to quantify the uncertainties because obviously there are a lot of uncertainties when we do this mathematical modeling. So how do we quantify them in order to assess what is the range of error that you can expect in the solutions? And then, of course, you need efficiency. I mean, there is no point in building a super duper complex model that cannot, you know, do the job uh, in a finite amount of time. Like, if you want to predict the weather for tomorrow, it should not be two days from now that you actually can finish the simulations to uh, to predict the weather for tomorrow. And then realism. Obviously, you know, you can put in everything you want together, but if the model, the coupled model, is not realistic, then you know, obviously it's of no use. So these are all the considerations that go into the optimization part of Earth system models. And we pay very careful attention to that because at no point in time are you ever going to have enough computer power to do, you know, everything that you really want. So it's it, it always comes down to a question of, question of optimization. And in terms of how, you know, what you use these models for is something like this, when you where you have weather and climate extremes, you have widespread disruptions and losses. And the key thing, what we what we kind of are studying in terms of both research and then um, translating the research into operations into in, in NOAA is things like frequency of occurrence of events, of extreme events, the track, location, severity, duration, 
uh, how early can you give alerts about an extreme event and then multiple stresses you know the same kind of storm system can cause multiple stress phenomena uh, like uh, hurricane uh, like storms tropical storms can spawn tornadoes once uh, the the storm comes over land so can we do all that with these mathematical models that's kind of the quest uh, that uh, GFTL has set for itself, and we try to, uh, and I try at least attempt to address these questions in a quantitative sense. Let me give some examples from uh, recent atmosphere and weather uh, computations. So one of the things um, that's happened in NOAA in, in the weather service in the U.S. is the adoption of the what's called FV3, which is the short form for finite volume cube sphere dynamical core. So this is the this is the engine you know which powers the Navier-Stokes equations and therefore kind of brings uh, the the dynamic dynamics into the whole system uh, and it's a sort of a dynamical thing that uh, has revolutionized uh, you know it, it's actually transformed the weather system, weather uh, com computations in the U.S. and the forecasts and basically uh, the weather the the uh, NOAA's weather forecast system replaced their old operational model with the new FE3 die core uh, in June of 2019. So it was selected as there was a competition in 2015, 2016. Uh, FE3 won that competition, and so it was adopted by the next generation global prediction system of the US. And then it took three years for it to really go operational. So it, in 2019, it's become operational. And what that has done, what is that, what that has revolutionized is in the following sense. So it actually captured, it actually now captures the rotational motions uh, very accurately. I mean, a lot of uh, there are people who spent about 10 years trying to develop the numerical solutions for that. And the idea of catching the rotational motion nicely is because that is kind of where your extremes occur. A lot of storms really have the rotational motions, and that's and the extreme storms have very ex very extreme rotational motions. The other thing that FE3 is, has done is connect the global and regional in a very consistent, physically consistent way. So previously, for example, when you had to drive local regional models, you took the global model and then use that as a boundary condition or use data from that as a boundary condition to, to power the regional model. And it, it sometimes introduced discontinuities because the two models did not necessarily have the same physics or the same dynamics. So now FV3 can be used to do global scale, uh, you know, very large scale dynamics as well as the very local scale dynamics at the one kilometer level, basically like to tornadoes and tornadic vortices. So this has bridged the global and regional in a very consistent way and very efficiently too, because one of the things that FV3 has done is calculate these things numerically very, very efficiently. And the most recent example I can give you is the global cloud resolving model. It's at three kilometers. It's atmosphere only, but it's at running at three kilometers global and what is very encouraging is uh, that it capture this actually what is showing is OLR, outgoing long wave radiation. So it's actually showing the cloud movements. Uh, and what you can see is, you know, vortices uh, forming everywhere, you know, consistent with what you see in the real atmosphere. And so this is a real boon. Now, you know, talking of comp computational limitations, we can run this only for 40 days right now at a time because it is so, you know, so computationally intensive. But it is the forerunner of a lot of interesting things happening at the cloud resolving scales where you're actually resolving cloud motions. Actually, even three kilometers is not truly enough, but at least this is the uh, this is a sort of a scale that uh, has been very nice to get to and have the model running. Just for comparison, the current uh, US weather model runs at uh, 12 and a half kilometer global. So this is uh, at least you know four times more in terms of uh, resolution in latitude longitude. Then oceans. So one of the things uh, now that's happening in the oceans is capturing all these processes. Uh, and you know I, I'm not kind of going into the mathematics of all this because some of it I actually don't know. But uh, this is all the processes that we capture in the ocean, uh, ranging from surface shear, micro breaking, uh, wind stress, of course, Langmuir circulations, uh, eddy stirring dynamics due to mesoscale motions, uh, deep uh, transports in the deep ocean, the internal mixing. Uh, and then tidal mixing, and then taking care of topography in the ocean. So these are all now captured in the ocean model. And so we have a global ocean model. What I'm going to show next is a simulation from the regional ocean model. And you can, what you can see, this is of course the east coast of US, Florida is here, and then this is the Gulf. 
And you can see sort of the rich um, richness of the eddies uh, carrying, you know, um, what this denoting is uh, water at different temperatures. And you can see it uh, carrying uh, eddies, which is important for the poor, equal to pole transport of uh, heat and salt. Uh, but this is very encouraging to us because, first of all, it does match the satellite uh, images of chlorophyll. So you can see where the upwellings are in terms of nutrients. Uh, but it's also a very uh, nice uh, you know, forward movement in terms of coastal inundation because now you can actually capture much more details of the coast than we could before. And plus, we've gone into seamless modeling where the same model is being used for weather and climate timescale. So you can actually look at sea level rise and then the synoptic storms riding on top of the sea level rise and how they influence uh, coastal properties. And then on the land side, just one one plot to show how we are capturing the heterogeneity of the land surface. But you have to capture in terms of land surface, soil moisture, evaporation, runoff, leaf area index. We're actually getting uh, GIS information on vegetation and then doing a machine learning on it to capture it in the model, in the, in the general situation model. And we're also now able to capture things like uh, the slopes, which is very important when you start to do river runoff, you, have, you want to capture these slopes. So that's sort of another uh, another sort of uh, development that has occurred in recent uh, years where we've been able to put the land onto a really much more uh, finer focus and therefore capture more of its uh, heterogeneity. So now let me get, get, you, get you some examples of what you've done with these models. And admittedly, these are going to be just examples, so uh, it, it'll be very short. But, you know, one of the exciting things that's happened with our recent generation of models, this is the, which we, we call fourth generation, Atmospheric Model 4, Climate Model 4, and Earth System Model 4. And one of the things we've we've seen, and we're kind of going through different models here. This was a model, a CM2, AM2 was in about 2005. CM3, AM3 was about 2012. And CM4, AM4 is about 2019. And what you can see is a systematic reduction of biases. All models have biases, and our model is no exception. So for example, sea surface temperature, for example, the bias has gone down, but the most important reduction in bias is precipitation, where you've gone down from 1.1 millimeters per day to now 0.8 millimeters per day global mean. Uh, and one sort of very important offshoot of this is when you reduce precipitation bias, you actually reduce the regional precipitation errors also. And most dramatically, the double ITCZ that kind of happens in every model, namely you get a peak on either side of the equator, uh, which doesn't exist in reality. But this kind of simulate this uh, improvement in precipitation actually brings down the scope of the error in the double ITCZ. And then on the left, you see kind of the Madden-Julian oscillation, eastward propagation. So this is the observation. And you can see that, and these are different models, but if you look at just this one model, climate model version four, uh, generation four, and the Earth system model, they kind of capture much better than we could before. So that's kind of a improvement. And this is needed because when you want to do weather, you want to capture this, which is also important for climate in terms of uh, the precip. So ge generally uh, a marked improvement uh, in in terms of reduction of biases as we have marched forward in the, in the modeling. And then another thing which we are very kind of uh, encouraged by is the capturing of category four and five hurricanes in models. So this is actually a 25 kilometer model, a 25 kilometer in the atmosphere and land, and uh, it's uh, one degree in the ocean. But it is able to capture the seasonal storms, category four and five. And, the, and what you can see is this is the model, bottom is the observations over the period of 79 to 2012. So it's about a 30 year period. And what you can see is the density of category four and five hurricanes in various regions. Uh, and the model seems to match it quite well in most of the regions, not in all, and quantitatively, there's still, it's it's not very good. But the fact that you can capture category four and five hurricanes is very exciting in the 25 kilometer model. Uh, and now, I, obviously, I think if your eyes go to the Indian Ocean, there is, there is not a, that, that the, the simulations are not that good. Uh, you know, if you look at uh, the Indian Ocean, it's kind of uh, pretty, not, not, not really very good. But the fact that Pacific and Atlantic are well captured is exciting enough. We didn't expect this of a 25 kilometer model. The fact that it does it is very encouraging. And the reason it does it is because if you look at the, the normalized uh, frequency of the wind speed, 
So in the observation, the black line is the observation. So you have wind speeds, you see going in a distribution of various storms, you have the wind speed going up to 70, 80 meters per second. The coarse resolution model, 50 kilometer models, which is not coarse, but it is coarse enough for this, doesn't capture those high wind speeds. But the red line, which is a 25 kilometer model, starts to capture the tail of these high winds. So that is what gives us uh, the confidence that you know we can actually predict category four and five storms ahead of time using these kinds of models. The, I mean, this is still experimental results, but uh, there's a lot of um, you, know, lo- you know a lot of uh, encouragement that we are getting out of these uh, runs. So now I'm I'm going to get into a particular problem involving the longer time scale, the multi-decadal time scale, and I'm actually going to talk about precipitation more and the effect of uh, aerosols on on the precipitation. So first of all, I want to go to what what are what are what is the driving force in terms of uh, multi-decadal changes? So this is a relative forcing, namely the effect of the emissions that happen. And you know this is from the IPCC, a very familiar looking diagram where the CO2 and other well-mixed greenhouse gases, WMGGs, are giving you a positive forcing. And then uh, counterbalancing that is aerosols, where uh, this is kind of the direct effect, which is the effect of aerosol on clear skies. And then when aerosols mix with clouds, they enhance the cloud albedo. And that's all mostly negative, except for aeros- for the direct aerosol effect, there is a positive contribution from black carbon or soot. But overall, it's a sort of a negative in terms of the effect of aerosol. And that counterbalances the greenhouse gas, especially over the last uh, century, from pre-industrial to present. So this is the forcing because of the emissions of the substances. What does it do to the climate system is the question we ask. Oh, before that, um, these aerosols come from various sources, which makes it a more difficult quantity to handle than carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases because those are very homogeneous. They have long lifetimes. You measure it in one place, you know it about you know everything about it. But for aerosols, they come from different sources as depicted here. And then those which are marked in red borders are human influenced emissions. And those marked in blue borders are those which are secondary emissions, like from trees, uh, trees emitting terpenes which form aerosols. And then you have the ones in green, which are natural aerosols, volcanoes, sea spray. And then you have a mixture of natural and human influence, like such as dust, and also fires, because they can be human influenced or, and, or natural. And because aerosols have short lifetimes, uh, they don't travel very far, but they stay in the atmosphere enough time, and they are emitted constantly, such that they actually affect the, the climate system. Now, uh, one of the things that uh, we always ask uh, is what is the uh, what is the what is kind of the effect of the aerosols in terms of affecting the radiation budget? And one example is from satellites, where if you look at the the uh, um, the dots and the circles, those are the seasonal cycle in various parts of the globe of aerosols. And what is this? What is plotted is optical depth, which is considered as a measure of the amount of aerosols. So you can see that the aerosols have a seasonal cycle everywhere uh, in every part of the globe, and that they are there in considerable uh, amounts, uh, enough to affect, as we'll see later, the solar radiation budget. And I won't go into the model because I'm going to talk about the model de- detail later, but you can see that if you let, look at the the, the black, the, the red line, which is our latest model, you can see that it captures the satellite data rather well. Um, come better than the previous model, which was a black line. So there is a confidence about the effect of aerosols being shown up in ob- showing up in observations and also showing up uh, in the model. So let me talk about the sensitivity of the relative perturbations and precipitation response. So I'm going to go back to an experiment that we did long time ago, but it's kind of very interesting because it's very simple. Uh, we understood very well back then. Supposing that, uh, so one of the things that happens with aerosols is that, uh, you know, they are only in the Northern Hemisphere for the most part. The emissions are mostly in the Northern Hemisphere. They have a short lifetime, so they stay in the Northern Hemisphere. Greenhouse gases, on the other hand, have long lifetime, particularly CO2, so it goes into both hemispheres. So what you have is a forcing on the system that is global in nature for greenhouse gases, but very localized in the Northern Hemisphere for aerosols. So we did an experiment where we asked, Supposing we make the uh, this, this, this non-hemisphere sulfate aerosol forcing exactly the same, but 
negative of the CO2 forcing such that the total global mean forcing is zero. So under these circumstances, the global mean temperature response would be zero. But in sorry, but in terms of the actual temperature response in the two hemispheres, you can see that while for greenhouse gases, it's fairly uniform throughout the globe, excepting you see the polar amplification at both poles. Uh, this is a simple model with uh, fixed clouds and a, and a ocean, a mixed layer ocean. And then for aerosol, you see the let's see the, the, this uh, this curve here is nothing in the southern hemisphere because no aerosols there, but in the northern hemisphere you have a small sharp dip in terms of the temperature. Now the global mean is still zero, but you can see the temperature in the two hemispheres is differently affected by greenhouse gases and aerosols. And the net result is almost, uh, it's not quite, but uh, it is a sort of a superposition of the two effects. And you can see that by either the black line or the dotted line, there is cooling in the northern hemisphere and there is kind of warming in the southern hemisphere. But precipitation becomes different. So you see in, in here, you know, it's kind of probably intuitive that you'll cool the northern hemisphere for aerosols, you'll warm everywhere for greenhouse gases in, in the case of greenhouse gases in both hemispheres. But when you go to um, the precipitation, it becomes very interesting. Now the greenhouse gas effect is fairly uniform. That's the dotted line, dashed line here. So it's pretty uniform, so rather uninteresting. But you look at the aerosol only, which is this uh, dash dot line, doesn't matter which line you look at, it is actually showing this uh, tendency towards a, a reduction of precipitation just uh, north of the equator and a corresponding increase in the south of the equator. This is a, and I'll, I'll, we'll explain this later, but this is the part that is very interesting. It's more interesting, it's further more interesting because when you combine the greenhouse gas and the aerosol labeled here as ALB, you see the resulting curve actually also follows the aerosol uh, solution. It doesn't follow the greenhouse gas solution. There's a reason for it, which we'll again discuss later, but bear that in mind because this is one of the important characteristics of the aerosols being present in one hemisphere. And this is a later study, I won't go through it, but it shows the same thing. You see the, it was a different model, a better model in 2010. And again, you see the same effect due to the aerosol, whereas greenhouse gas is more, more uniform, relatively more uniform. And this was actually with a full coupled ocean. Oh, no, this is also a mixed layer ocean model, but it's a more refined atmosphere. So now I'm going to extend this uh, concept, which is done with very simple models, to the more modern models and talking about the 20th and 21st century. So first of all, in the models that we have now, uh, as I said, the whole system is coupled. So the aerosols emitted from land or even ocean areas are advected uh, both horizontally and transported upward. They interact with solar radiation, uh, absorb or deplete radiation, um, and then they, get, uh, they can uh, be interstitial aerosols combined with water drops to form clouds or to affect clouds, which then affects the radiation balance of the cloudy atmosphere. So, so this whole effect, system of effects is captured in the model. Um, and this is just a curve reflecting the fact that both sulfate and black carbon are mostly in the northern hemisphere and very little in the southern hemisphere. So it is a mainly hemispheric effect. And this introduces uh, asymmetric forcing between the two hemispheres. So it's a, a pretty important large scale phenomena where there's a hemis hemispheric asymmetry introduced. Um, there are some complications like, you know, for aerosols in clouds, this is actually an uncertainty. Uh, when you increase aerosol number, the, you see that the cloud drop number also goes up and the increase in cloud drop number actually increases its reflection. So that is the added effect of the aerosol cloud interactions uh, that we referred to earlier in the relative forcing diagram. Uh, and part of this is due to dynamics and part of it is thermodynamics. Eh? But this is actually uncertainty and inhibits the quantitative uh, uh, certainty of, of the calculations. Now, one of the things that aerosols do is reflected in this curve. So uh, if you look at the total forcing at the top of the atmosphere, by that by forcing, I mean, if you add all the human influenced uh, uh, gases and particles, what do they do to the top of the atmosphere? Well, uh, you don't have to worry about the numbers. The red and orange means it's positive. So you're adding heat into the system of 2.8 watts per square meter because of the increase in greenhouse gases. Now you see certain blue areas, those are negative areas, and they are precisely where aerosol emissions are the largest. 
So where aerosol, aerosol emissions are largest, you actually damp the positive forcing due to greenhouse gases and introduce a negative forcing. But by and large, in both hemispheres and top of the atmosphere, the forcing generally is positive. But you look at the surface, you look, I mean, again, the color shading is the same. Positive is reflected by yellow and orange curves. Uh, negative is by blue curves. And you see in the, in the, at the surface, you see a tremendous reduction of energy. And so we talked about one asymmetry being between the two hemispheres. This is another asymmetry between the top of the atmosphere and surface that also plays an important role in the role of aerosols versus greenhouse gases. And actually, this was a model that we had in 2005. This actually is a Japanese model at that time. It shows the same qualitative result. So the aerosols do this asymmetry between sort of the top and the bottom of the atmosphere as well. So one thing to remember now in terms of uh, we're kind of trying to explain what's happening in the what's going to happen because of this asymmetry. So one thing to remember before we go further is that when you take the Earth's radiation budget and these are estimates drawn from satellite and surface measurements for climatology, you at the surface the balance goes like this. The net short wave at the surface is 168 watts per square meter. And the long wave is a net negative. The surface is losing long wave because it's emitting more than it's receiving. And that is about 66 watts per square meter. So the rest of it, a minus 102 watts per square meter, is made up by the non radiative processes, basically sensible and latent heat, because you're getting more short wave, you're emitting uh, not as much long wave. So you have to balance it by emitting uh, latent heat and sensible heat. And it turns out that most of that non radiative flux exchange is through latent heat. So latent heat sensibly is a factor of three. So bear that in mind as you go along, because this is an important aspect of the surface flux balance. So first of all, when you run the climate model, this is sort of what we get. And just maybe look at the box in blue, because that's all I want to focus on for the purpose of this talk. So this is the last 50 years of 20th century as similar with the model. And if you run, so with the model, you know, you can ask the question of, what if I had the climate determined only by greenhouse gases? Or what if the climate was determined only by aerosols? So you can ask these questions because it's a mathematical model. You can adjust the parameters to take out aerosols, take out greenhouse gases, and so on. So if you had only greenhouse gases, you'd get this much warming. It's about 1.2 Kelvin, the global mean. But if you add aerosols because of their negative forcing effect, you get a decrease of, in this, in this case, in this model, minus 0.4. So the aerosols have offset about a third of the greenhouse gas effect on the surface temperature. And this, in fact, is the observed temperature. So if you look at the net residual, which is the all forcing result here, it's not exactly the same as the observed, but it's pretty close in terms of the ensemble range uh, that you're getting. So, so there, is a, there is a sort of a validity to the argument that aerosols have offset the greenhouse gas effects. So that's surface temperature. Now let's look at precipitation. Now, um, I would just ask you to focus on the top left panel, which is a global mean precipitation. And you see that the well-missed greenhouse gas has increased precipitation. The aerosol has decreased precipitation. But you notice the size of the bars. They are almost canceling each other. So the aerosol effect has been disproportionately larger on the precipitation than it has been on the surface temperature. And they all forcing, which is a net result of uh, everything, is slightly negative in the case of this model run uh, and is kind of dominated by aerosol. If you look at the more regional aspects, you see much stronger effect of aerosols, primarily because most of the aerosol effects in Northern Hemisphere are actually uh, over Asia. Uh, but it's not restricted to Asia because you look at Europe that also has an aerosol signal, which is uh, negative. Um, and so that's kind of how precipitation is now. Now we want to understand this kind of why, why is it like that? And the clue comes from looking at a surface uh, flux uh, change. So to, in, order, in order to try to probe this further, look at maybe the bottom left first, panel first. So this is a simulation running with just well-mixed greenhouse gases. And the different components plotted here are surface balance, the net, net short wave, net long wave, uh, and then latent heat and sensible heat. So this is now the greenhouse gas case only. So greenhouse gases, as you've seen from the previous uh, you know, plots, they increase precipitation <coughs> and, and they, warm this, they warm the atmosphere and surface. So what does that warming do? You have more long wave coming to the surface because you've increased 
uh, not only CO2 and other wellness greenhouse gases, but you increase water vapor as well. And water vapor is strong greenhouse gas, so it emits more radiation to the surface. So you have an increase in the net long wave at the surface. So in order to balance that, the surface has to release more, more heat. And it does so in the form of latent heat. So latent heat is negative, which means a loss from the surface. And so the surface is emitting latent heat, which of course then, as when it condenses, when the when the heating condenses to form clouds and precipitates, that's what gives rise to the increase in precipitation. So that explains in the greenhouse gas case why you get the increase in precipitation because of this balance that latent heat has to evaporate more from the surface. In the case of the aerosol, we already saw that short wave flux to the surface would decrease because the aerosols are depleting the radiation from the sun by both reflecting and absorbing. Now in this case, the latent heat again comes into the balanced picture, but now because the depletion of the short radiation of the surface, there tends to be less evaporation. And so the surface actually gains heat because it's uh, not emitting as much latent heat. There's not so much evaporation going on. So that happens in the aerosol, sorry, in the aerosol case. And so now we look at all fours, which is a combination of the two, you see all these effects. You see the net short wave decreasing, you see the net long wave increasing, and in the case of this model, the latent heat, you know, ref reflects that balance. Um, and, and so that kind of what then causes a reduction in precipitation governed by the aerosol, more governed by the aerosol uh, than, well, it compensates the greenhouse gas almost completely. Um, so one of the consequences of this has been in terms of the precipitation over India, and particularly over the north central part of India over these last 50 years, and in fact, what you see in the in the data, and this happens to, to come from CRU, the observational data, but the other data sets you look at produce the same thing, except in quantitatively, it's the trend is a bit different. But you see the black line here running through, I mean, the black line is the observation, but you see the black line running through for the north central India, which is the Indo-Gangetic plain, you see a decrease in precipitation. Now, one of the consequences is that if you run the model with just greenhouse gases, which is a purple line here, you will get an increase. So increase in greenhouse gases alone would just produce an increase in precipitation over this region. But that, that's not what happened. So the only way you can explain this decrease is to invoke aerosols. And that's kind of what is done by the green curve. The green curve is the tropospheric aerosol. You can see how it's a decrease. And there's actually a small contribution from natural aerosol, which comes from volcanoes. Uh, over this whole entire period, volcanoes have been an have been responsible for affecting some of the Earth's climate. So the total all forcing, which is the red line here, uh, shows a decrease, which, um, you know, as it shows a decrease and is qualitatively reasonably similar to the trend. So the aerosols have affected over this period, over the last half of the 20th century, the precipitation trend over the north central uh, part of India. Not only that, now we can actually explain uh, this uh, whole phenomena in terms of the Hadley and Walker circulation effects. So imagine, so this is schematic of the climatology with the Hadley and the Walker circulation. When you have greenhouse gas increase only, you actually tend to affect the Walker circulation. It actually weakens because of the fact that one part of the tropics is warmer than the other and you're adding more warmth it actually uh, does an asymmetric effect on a longitudinal sense and you weaken the Walker circulation. In the case of aerosol, it's not the Walker circulation. There's a slight increase actually in the, in the Walker circulation, but that's a negligible effect. What the most serious consequence is the Hadley circulation being affected because of the fact that in Northern Hemisphere, you've drawn, uh, you've, you've got aerosol, you've drawn down the radiation, you've reduced diabetic heating, and therefore the Hadley cell uh, is weakened. Meridional circulation is weakened. And the net result when you have both greenhouse gas and aerosol is just a combination of the two. You have a weakening of the meridional circulation. You have a weakening of the Walker circulation. And that's the system under the greenhouse gas and aerosol case. So this has now been shown in a lot of studies. And this is arising due to the fact that you have the north-south asymmetry in the forcing because of, because of aerosols. Um, so the, I showed you results from one model. So we can look at other models. And this happens to be from the couple model into comparison project five uh, of the World Climate Research Program, the database. So I won't go into individual models, but you can see that all other models, when they're coming through the 20th century, they see a decrease in precipitation 
uh, over the period between about 1950 and about 1990. Uh, there are a couple of models which don't. I mean, there's one model which actually doesn't, and that we feel that's because the aerosol forcing there was uh, was weaker. If you look at the curves for the greenhouse gases, you see they all show an increase. So under a greenhouse gas increase, no matter which model you look at, they all have to show an increase. And that's theoretic, that's consistent with the theory that we have about you know the increase of water vapor under warming and what that would do to precipitation. So what about observations? You know, what other observations? I mean, we, I showed observations of India, but what about other observations? So here's a, a, a paper from Polson et al. where they actually looked at the various data sets. And if you, and there are a lot of lines here, but if you look at the black line here, that's kind of a mean of the observation. And you see there's a, and, and the envelope of the models is given by this sort of shading there. So there's a lot of noise. Precipitation carries a lot of noise, but you can see that over these 50 years, um, extending to about 1990s, there is actually a hint of, not a hint, more than a hint of a decrease in precipitation, the observations <clears throat> and the mean of several models also tends to reflect that, uh, at least qualitatively. And interestingly, this paper showed that that coincides with the northern hemisphere sulfate loading being very high, especially in the 1970s and 80s, and then it's been decreasing uh, since then uh, through now. Uh, another set of observations was um, this paper here, uh, where Chung and Ramanathan, where they actually showed that from 1950 to 2002, uh, they actually show the weakening of the Indian monsoon, the same region that I showed, um, and then the north-south shift in Asian rainfall. And also in a very related way, the Sahelian drought, same thing. Uh, this actually was a very interesting thing because Charney, Jewel Charney, pioneer in dynamical meteorology, actually proposed back in 1975 that the Sahelian drought was being caused by an albedo effect and he didn't, you know, he went through the arguments in a very theoretical sense, but it was actually basically the same thing, that you had the asymmetry because of the north-south uh, forcing difference, uh, north-south forcing difference because of the asymmetry, you actually kicked in uh, a sort of a weakening of the meridional circulation, and therefore you got this asymmetry in the precipitation where the, the Sahelian part was ended in a drought, and the south of it, actually there was an increase in precipitation. And then this is another figure, this from IPCC 2007, and it shows this, uh, if you look at just the black curve, that's the observation. It shows that, uh, that the black curve is the observation. So you see the, the dip in the part just north of the equator and an increase in south of the equator. And, and the reason why this happens is because, you know, the diabetic heating is reduced in the northern hemisphere because of the aerosol reduction of aerosol interaction with solar radiation. And what that does is, uh, it creates a deficit of energy. And so there has to be, uh, a, so what, what happens is vertical velocity decreases. There's no longer a rising motion because diabetic heating has been reduced. But the energy, the, the mass flow has to be balanced. So the meridional exchange of mass causes an increase in velocity just south of the equator. And therefore, that increase in velocity actually produces your precipitation increase. So the precipitation decrease and increase are perfectly logical uh, in terms of the the uh, diabetic heating and the cross meridional uh, flow of mass that has to occur because of continuity. Um, finally, I want to kind of show, this is all of a recent result, um, trying to use the model to inquire whether you can sort of uh, talk about Indian monsoon depressions. So, um, you know, this is the era analysis of the Indian monsoon depressions. And, and what you're seeing is the uh, shading is a long-term mean of the monsoon depression averaged over, this is actually over 40 years. And the uh, blue dots are depressions at the genesis points of monsoon depression to the north of 20 degrees north, and the green are to the south of 20 degrees north. And actually the results I showed you from the model so far actually doesn't do a great job in terms of monsoon depression. You see, you know, it, it kind of gets to the right area, but you know, the dots are not that much in density as they are in the ERA analysis. So this was a model in 2012, and most of the results I showed were from that model. But the latest model, which is 2019, which kind of we are still analyzing, actually it seems to nail the analysis uh, absolutely spectacularly. I mean, I we can't explain why this happens. It might be fortuitous, but it is interesting that, you know, both the area as well as the kind of lineup of the dots is 
very very nice i mean and i and you know this is something we are still exploring but this is sort of i thought uh, something that should interest uh, especially uh, the audience uh, in this area because uh, it's uh, it's kind of very significant for this area all right okay so i kind of didn't mention this as i was going along too much but there are uncertainties and what are the uncertainties so mainly the uncertainties have to do with aerosols because you know we understand the greenhouse gas forcing co2 forcing very very well uh, there's many maybe only a 10% 15% uncertainty in terms of the forcing but aerosols because of diversity of the sources that short lifetimes uh, create uncertainties and one of the uncertain one of the sort of really important uncertainties they create is the interaction with clouds clouds are inherently as you all know clouds are inherently very difficult entities to deal with and there are all sorts of clouds so just maybe looking at both the low clouds shallow clouds and the convective clouds and you see kind of various processes that happen new particle production scavenging uh, droplet coalescence uh, activation these there are still theoretical gaps in these processes such that they all affect the net uncertainty of what aerosol interaction with cloud does and furthermore all this occurs on a spatial scale as listed here about 50 kilometers or 100 kilometers so within 50 kilometers all this is happening for a model to capture this accurately is a really challenging thing and what we do is we parameterize these processes and there are a lot of uncertainties that creep in uh, because of that even more than this is the ice cloud aspect so those are kind of little bit water and convective clouds but the ice clouds and mixed phase clouds where the nucleation can happen with all sorts of uh, effluents coming from the surface with its biomass burning biological emissions urban industrial emissions and how do they get caught up in ice clouds how do they form ice clouds what are the processes of nucleation and then what happens to the ice clouds i mean when they get glaciated uh, rain, come down as precipitation in the form of ice or snow what exactly happens there that is still a major uncertainty and there was a study uh, led by Sa john seinfeld in 2016 uh, from the academy um, which which uh, which i participated in where a number of us tried to pin down these uncertainties or at least identify what the places are which can be better resolved but anyway these are uncertainties all right so i talked about 20th century and i'll conclude with uh, a little bit of speculation about 21st century which is of course already underway so in 21st century in terms of the projections of what will happen the two things which are definitely going to happen well mixed greenhouse gas will continue to increase i mean there are no easy mitigation measures so they are going to continue to increase but aerosol is going to see a decrease in fact we are already seeing that over north america and europe and even parts of asia and part of the reason there is because aerosols are very easily health and visibility hazards so their decreases are something that uh, society wants so that's going to happen so now it's interesting to ask the question if our physics treatment for the 20th century especially the last half of the 20th century when aerosols were increasing if that is correct then should we expect that with aerosols decreasing there will be a reversal of 20th century effects all the model calculations show yes that is the case because if you look at this diagram which is plotting the relative precipitation from so i think going from 1860 to 2000 and then at 2100 so you know uh, the, the different curves here so this curve, red curve is if you if you only had a greenhouse gas increase so you can see the precipitation will continue to increase keep increasing at, at to, to, through 2100 if you look at the aerosol only forcing that's a brown line here you see there's a decrease which is kind of what we saw in the previous plots and so Uh, that the curve stops here so till 2000 you have seen a decrease and you can see the net effect the blue line is following the aerosol more than it's following the greenhouse gas but now let's say you remove that lever where greenhouse gas keeps on increasing aerosol you have taken off the atmosphere what happens then well that's what will happen you will see the precipitation increase and eventually the solution would have to go to the greenhouse gas solution when let's say in a theoretical limit all aerosols have been drawn to the atmosphere so we i mean this is kind of not just this model all the models show that to to a sort of lesser or more degree depending on the model characteristics but this is something that you would expect to happen and in fact 
this is a global mean precipitation. If you look at certain regions, for example, Asia, the precipitation increases uh, much more. I mean, in fact, one almost uh, 40% of the increase in precipitation is coming because of the drawdown of aerosol. And just like we, uh, we discussed the uh, precipitation in the context of surface flux changes, you can do the same thing now for 2100 related to 2000. So again, now you see the net short wave has increased related to 2000 because you've taken out the aerosols, there's more radiation coming to the surface. The long wave keeps increasing related to 2000 because you've added more greenhouse gases in 2100. So now the latent heat release, uh, latent heat change in the surface has to be the sum of the two. So now it is actually going to result in much more evaporation from the surface than before in order to balance the short wave and long wave inputs. And therefore, that's why you see more, more increase in precipitation. So that's kind of the story, the reversal. It's a comp almost a complete reversal in terms of, uh, you know, if you want to have a physical consistent, physically consistent theory, that's what you'd expect. And that's what the models show. Uh, so let me conclude with the following points. So what I hope I have uh, convinced you of is the effect of aerosols on circulation and precipitation in addition to surface temperature. And the 20th century anthropogenic aerosol influence on precipitation offsets the influence of the greenhouse gases. In fact, uh, our calculations with this model show it's almost a complete offset, which, which actually, okay. And then mechanisms due to the aerosols affect surface fluxes, and that's how the hydrologic cycle gets affected. The surface flux influence is a strong effect on the hydrologic cycle of evaporation and precipitation. There's non-linearity. And then there's a shift of the ITCZ because you're shifting the precipitation belt southward by uh, decreasing the precipitation north of the equator and increasing it south of the equator. Uh, in terms of the observed Indian monsoon rainfall, the aerosol effects establish a physical consistency. With greenhouse gas, you would actually have gotten an increase in precipitation. Uh, I mean, notwithstanding internal variability, you would have seen a trend in increasing precipitation. That didn't happen. So aerosols are a good plausible causal factor. Um, one thing to kind of note is the knowledge gaps that exist, particularly in aerosol cloud interactions that inhibit a quantitative understanding. And then 21st century, you know, this would be very interesting to see whether if, if the aerosols are drawn down, whether corresponding the precipitation actually uh, goes up. And Asia would see probably the most difference because Asia has seen the most decrease in, in terms of precipitation. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and uh, very much uh, enjoyed this opportunity to you know, talk about these uh, subjects to you and very much thank you for the in in invitation to give this lecture. So I will end there. I'll be very happy to take uh, questions. Thank you. Can you hear me? Hello? Okay, are you able to hear me? Yes, I, I can hear you. Right, yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah, there is a question from a student, uh, Dr. Ramaswamy. Okay. Uh, that uh, He says that urbanization is increasing at an alarming rate throughout the globe. Uh, can it modulate the dynamics or the thermodynamics uh, through the changes in energy fluxes and how are how can they be incorporated in numerical weather prediction models oh good that's a good question uh, let me take it i think it's in two parts the first part urbanization yes would affect the thermodynamic and dynamic fluxes certainly and in fact uh, we are already seeing uh, effects on uh, evaporation precipitation in numerous parts of the world where urbanization has increased uh, significantly uh, so yeah, what, what I mean generally, you know, what whatever happens to the land surface, whether it's urbanization, desertification, uh, afforestation, they all affect the exchange of fluxes, especially latent and sensible heat between the surface and the atmosphere. So yes, the answer is urbanization would modify it. Now, in terms of global effects, um, probably you know it's going to be more manifest regionally rather than being manifest globally, only because you know the area of the land is, is smaller. Uh, so urbanization would definitely affect, but it would be kind of confined to probably regional levels. 
on your second question, uh, sorry, I forgot the second question. Um, can you just repeat the second part of the question? Yeah, can they be incorporated in ah. numerical prediction model? Yeah, I think so. The way so we are actually models are beginning to incorporate urban areas very crudely, perhaps, because, you know, the urban areas are represented basically uh, in the following sense. They are represented by canyons uh, and towers. So if you can imagine towers representing, you know, buildings, canyons representing street level, and then there are variations of that, including vegetation. So that's how models are incorporating it. But it is actually very effective because, see, for uh, what you need from urbanization uh, in terms of thinking about what what should you incorporate, it is the uh, it is a uh, albedo, the the reflectivity of the surface, and the roughness. So that is why, for example, creating towers and canyons gives you some sense of uh, of a uh, of a uh, simulation of roughness of the surface, and then the albedo is like you know whether the the buildings are more gray or black or white. Uh, and, and and so there there are incorporations of this in models. Um, the the one problem is, of course, when you you can put anything in a model, but you know how do you test it? Uh, you have to kind of uh, uh, do observations and then you have to test it. Those are somewhat lacking right now. I mean, even in urban areas which have started to take observations, the length the observation time series is not not all that great. Um, and so it's hard to be, you know, very, it's hard to kind of be very uh, convincing about the model's ability to capture uh, these effects. They're coming along, but I think it's going to take some time. Also, one more thing that models do capture is the exchange of carbon, you know, in, in buildings and, you know, in cities. Uh, how is the carbon exchange between the, between the sort of surface consisting of the city? And the atmosphere that too is being actually actually captured, uh, and also aerosol uh, exchange. But the processes are recognized; they are beginning to get captured. But we still lack uh, enough of a time series and enough of uh, observations in various places to, you know, to get at the meat of the problem. You know, can can when we assert that it's being done all right? I think the answer is still a little bit diffuse as to whether it's being done all right. Thanks for the question. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, another question from Professor Bhaskar Rao. Um, the Indian summer monsoon rainfall of uh, this year, that is 2020, has been very good, perhaps more than normal, and good spatial distribution and higher than normal rainfall over most of the regions. Uh, could it be attributed to the lowering of aerosols all over the globe in general, and in India in particular, or uh, is it due to COVID-related lockdown? Ah, uh, um, no, I think actually, so the precipitation actually has been increasing since the low point in the 80s and 90s. The precipitation over the last 20 years do, in, a, in a large part of the globe is actually increasing. Uh, but that has to be tempered with the observation that some of the extreme precipitation in some areas um, has been going either way. So areas which used to get precip anyway are getting more areas which are getting less precip are getting less. So less is getting less, more is getting more. And those are the extremes. But in a general sense, a large scale mean is increasing. Whether that's due to, you know, aerosol drawdown still is, I mean, I think 20 years is not enough of the record to kind of attribute it to aerosol. So I think I would say that uh, it is pro probably possible it's not increasing. I mean, I mean, the presentation. Sorry, the presentation is not continuing to decrease. So that is one hint that maybe it's the aerosol effects and to some extent land surface effects as well in the northern hemisphere with a more aridity, more desertification, which would do the same thing that aerosols do. Uh, I mean, Charney showed this uh, in 1975 paper that you can have the same thing. So, so it, that can happen. Now, uh, again, I forgot the second part of the question. I got so wrapped up in the first part. What is the second part of the question, Dr. Vasco's question? Is, is it due to COVID-related? Uh, ah, I yeah, I I don't think so. I think the COVID effects uh, have not. I don't think we realize. We do see. Actually, we've done calculations uh, where we've taken the satellite uh, observation of aerosols and actually seen what it does over, especially China and India, where there was a large reduction of aerosols. Um, 
but we don't see um, anything easily attributable in terms of uh, precipitation even over the indian monsoon region but that's not to say it hasn't it isn't there it's just that you know it's our inability to dissect the signal from the from the noise in the model i think that uh, what will be interesting to see is next year uh, what happens because i mean hopefully the well either the co- the, the emissions would all go going would be going back to normal in which case uh, you should not see this reduction but in general it's very hard to do year to year attribution um, if uh, if the emissions had been going down for 2 3 years in a row then you can make some statement about attribution otherwise it's very difficult to attribute but one thing is sure i mean uh, the the question points out i think uh, prompts me to say that uh, the precipitation has not been going down anymore global mean it's it's sort of either stable or it's going up so we have to see another 10 years of record i mean i think we'll demonstrate this point one way or the other Uh, the other question from a student is uh, uh, which gfdl model uh, is good to simulate the indian summer monsoon yeah you know our in our history uh, going back to you know suki manabi's uh, pioneering works back in 1980s our models have always done a good job on the indian summer monsoon more than really any other institutions model i don't know why nobody we don't know why but we always done a good job on the indian monsoon and so i would suggest that uh, you know the the model that we did in 2005 cm2 um, that actually had a very nice both mean and variance uh, of the monsoon um, and the current model uh, i think if you i would suggest that you know look at the, uh, the this publicly available data sets from uh, the north american multimodal ensemble nmme and one of the gfdl models uh, is run there it's called floor f l o r and i think you should look at the statistics on the model you'll see um, i mean it does for year to year variability but you and i think they have data for the last 6 years uh, take a look at that i think you, you might you might sort of be impressed by how well it simulates the monsoon uh, even including the year to year variability uh, and that's kind of publicly available data set so that would be sort of a good model to explore Uh, i think there's statistics statistics in the monsoon yeah uh, one question from dr naidu uh, are the aerosols playing a role in creating inversions in the monsoon season over the arabian sea and its surroundings yes uh, and that's due to the absorbing aerosol the absorbing aerosols you know absorb the energy in the atmosphere and in the uh, arabian sea as well as along the coastline they actually create a stability and that creates an inversion so the inversion does occur in the case but uh, you know in most models what is happening is the sulfate effects uh, dominate the large scale um, flow so while you get these pockets of inversion uh, and stability in in various parts of the region uh, overall in the whole region the scattering aerosol dominates which of course doesn't store doesn't absorb energy it kind of just reflects the energy that brings me to another point i think which uh, dr which professor baskara had raised about or some um, some or maybe a student had raised about the effect of aerosols locally versus far away so we are actually finding that in the early part of the monsoon um it is the aerosols locally that are more responsible for the change in precipitation but as you come towards july august uh, sorry not july august september period you actually have remote aerosols starting to exert a control through their control on the large scale flow so it's a mixed bag it's not just local aerosols all the time it depends on kind of which part of the season in the monsoon you're looking at yeah uh, another question is uh, uh, this is from ranjit sarangi Uh, he has a query on the trend and height of the aerosol vertical layer variation and its climatology uh the vertical variation um yeah. so so you know most of the, so the aerosols that cause the most climatic effect are really effectively in the bound effectively in the boundary layer so you know 2 to 3 kilometers um is kind of where you know the aerosols generally taper off the ones that cause the most climatic effect um and also because of interaction with low clouds 
but you can have uh, aerosols. I mean, it has been found in observations, of course, over the Indian region that aerosols can invigorate clouds. So basically, you know, you have aerosols, um, you know, in updrafts, and if the cloud doesn't condense at the lower altitudes, and then it's pumped up to very high altitudes, and then it forms ice clouds. And so in locally, you can have a lot of those effects occurring in or on top of the generally, you know, large scale effects. So you can have a lot of local effects. So so the vertical and, and there, you know, vertical profile of aerosols does matter because where are the aerosols? Are they really at two kilometers? Can you find them at five kilometers? And it doesn't take many aerosols to start nucleating clouds and uh, causing updraft. So you can have places where aerosols go up to five kilometers. And as you go more to the mountains, more towards <laughs> the Himalayas, you have this lofting effect. So aerosols from the plains can actually be found as high as even eight or 10 kilometers you know, in the atmosphere. So there's a lot of regional variation on this. If you're just talking about the plains, then it's probably more confined to, you know, roughly kind of the one kilometer, two kilometer scale height. I think one question from my side, sure. uh, the last one. Uh, you said the well-mixed greenhouse gases are increasing while the aerosols are coming down, is it? Uh, yeah, wellness gases are increasing, right. Right. Yeah. Uh, and uh, well, what is the effect on the tropical cyclones, especially in the north? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. I mean, uh, this is kind of a mixed bag there because um, what we find uh, in, in our models, and that's one of reflecting the observations, is that tropical cyclones have not in general increased over the 20th century. But what has happened is changes in the distribution of the cyclones. So what we see is a spatial shift in the Atlantic and in the Pacific of the tropical cyclones. So the number of cyclones hasn't changed, but there's been a shift. And then we also find that, uh, and this is more towards the future. So as the warming goes on, the global warming goes on, what we are seeing is, and this is kind of borne out by a lot of models, not all, but several models, there's a decrease in the number of storms. So there's a decrease number of tropical storms, but there's an increase in category four and five. So it's like when the storms form, they really become category four and five, but the total number of storms actually is decreased. And uh, the reason for that is this competition between the heating of the sea surface and the gradient between the uh, tropical sea surface near the e equator and the mid latitude sea surface temperature. That creates a wind shear. So what is happening in the warming is the wind shear effects are damping down the smaller storms, okay. uh, but damping down the no number of storms. But once the, uh, once the sea surface temperature and the wind shear kind of lock up in a, in a, in a sort of a, uh, in a sense, which is accelerating the tendency to do the storm, then you're getting this category four and five. But you know, this is still, uh, very much research in progress. I, I think that there's a lot of uncertainty about this. And also, this is just talking about large scale. There are now theories, I think particularly there's one for the Arabian Sea, where there's been a change in the storms over the last uh, few decades, and the last two or three decades. And some of it is being attributed to just aerosol microphysics. That because of aerosols, you actually have some microphysical effects happening in clouds. And that that is changing the number of storms that form in the Arabian Sea. Uh, but Arabian Sea, I'm less con I'm less sure about, you know, in terms of the processes. But Pacific and Atlantic, there is actually uh, several models now which do point out the number of storms will decrease, but uh, the category four and five will increase. And then over the last 100 years, there has been no measurable increase in the number of storms, but the spatial distribution has shifted. And there are some recent papers which actually suggest that uh, the storms are, uh, you know, lasting a longer time and they are traveling more slowly. So the destructive effect is spread over a longer distance and over a longer period of time. Uh, that the why that is happens, that is still not clear, although that's that's being observed now that uh, the rate of slowdown. Of <laughs> यदि ब्रेकफास्ट है ना कहा
I can't hear you. Uh, Dr. Ramaswamy, one yes. last question from uh, yes. one. Uh, sure. Uh, is it possible for the GFDL analysis uh, uh, to be downloaded uh, for reading? Oh, I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you last year. Last oh, microphone. Is a GFDL model? Uh, outputs can no, be downloaded. Down down okay. Okay. Uh, sorry, I still didn't get the last one. It's a GFDL model, and after that, I didn't catch. Uh, model outputs can be downloaded. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, if you go to the World Climate Research Program, CMIP 6, Couple Model Intercomparison Project 6, CMIP 6 database, all these results are there. And in fact, CMIP 5 database is already, is already there. CMIP 6 database, which has just started, is all also there. There are a lot of models that you can look at in the CMIP 6 database. Uh, and all these models have all the results stored in terms of time series, et cetera, all the way from uh, pre-industrial, which is a 1860 to 2100. So uh, the, all these model results are there. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ramaswamy Garu. Uh, My pleasure. Lecture. And uh, joining me uh, is uh, my head of the department, Dr. C. V. Naidu, uh, uh, who will be proposing a, a formal vote of thanks, Dr. Naidu. Thank you. My, my pleasure. Excellent lecture, sir. We are very grateful to you. Thank well, you so sir, much. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I really enjoyed it. I, I wish I could have been there in person, but that's another time. <laughs> Good morning to all. I thank all the researchers and students who attended the lecture entitled Modeling and Understanding the Global Climate System from Past to Future, delivered by Dr. V. Ramaswamy Garu, Director of NOVA's Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory. Dr. Ramaswamy Garu is the most prominent researcher and a legend in the scientific community in the world. His research career has focused on improving our understanding of atmospheric physics and the roles of natural and human influenced factors driving climate change by developing and using state of art of the climate models. Dear sir, as a renowned researcher, your expertise is of great value to the web series. We are very fortunate today to hear a very enlightening lecture. I should be thankful to you, sir, for giving us an inspiring lecture. Dear sir, there are some promising students and researchers in our Department of Meteorology and Oceanography. I am looking forward for your help in the development of our Department of Meteorology and Oceanography, Andhra University. Dear sir, you are welcome to our department whenever you are in India. Thank you, sir. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure, my pleasure to talk yeah, to you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks thank to everyone. Sir. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, bye-bye. 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 Thank you.